The HLS schedule is significantly challenged and in our estimation could be years late for a 2027 Artemis III moon landing. That's what panelist Paul Hill, former director of mission operations at NASA, said at a public meeting on September 19th. That conclusion, Hill said, came after a visit to SpaceX's Starbase facility last month, where he and fellow panelists, former astronauts Charlie Precourt and Kent Rominger, met with company executives and got a first-hand look at progress on Starship. The main issue seems to be cryogenic propellant transfer. Starship needs to be refueled in low Earth orbit before heading to the moon, but the SpaceX team still hasn't nailed down a working solution. This version of Starship will be the first capable of such a transfer, and development has been slowed further by ongoing engine redesigns. The issue was also highlighted earlier this month during a September 3rd Senate Commerce Committee hearing on the growing space competition with China. Former NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine warned that the complexity of NASA's current moon landing architecture, centered around SpaceX's Starship, could cause the U.S. to fall behind. Look at the architecture that we have developed to land American astronauts on the moon, Bridenstine said. It is highly unlikely that we will land on the moon before China. Starship, a fully reusable, heavy-lift launch vehicle, is the linchpin of NASA's human landing system for Artemis 3 and 4. But it's not just one rocket. A lunar mission using Starship could require a dozen or more additional launches to place tanker ships in orbit and fill a fuel depot, which will then refuel the lander for its trip to the moon. So, is Starship actually the thing that could keep us from getting back to the moon? To be fair, all stages of the Artemis III project have encountered delays. The Orion spacecraft and space launch system, built by a group of contractors including L3 Harris Technologies, Boeing, and Lockheed Martin, are also billions of dollars over budget. But the Starship piece is considered by most former NASA officials to be the riskiest and the most likely to face significant additional delays. That's because it's responsible for the largest number of unproven technological advances needed to complete the mission, according to a NASA report last year. Part of the problem, former NASA officials acknowledge, is that they chose an excessively complicated lunar landing plan, starting back during Trump's first term. The SLS rocket and Orion capsule can get astronauts into lunar orbit and back home, but NASA didn't have a way to get them down to the lunar surface and back. When you compare Orion to the Apollo Command and Service module, the differences are pretty obvious. Orion has a bigger capsule but a much smaller service module. Apollo, on the other hand, had a smaller capsule and a larger service module, and that extra size mattered. The Apollo service module wasn't just life support. It also had to slow down the combined spacecraft so it could enter low lunar orbit and then later propel the command module back to Earth. That required a lot of propellant. On the other hand, the Orion capsule weighs about 60% more than Apollo's, but its service module actually carries less propellant. That means it can't do what Apollo's did. Orion can support the crew and get into lunar orbit, but not into the tight, low lunar orbit that Apollo used. Instead, it goes into a more distant and easier-to-reach orbit called a near-rectilinear halo orbit. It also can't carry a lander with it. What it can do is reach that higher orbit and then return to Earth. And that's about it. So NASA had to come up with another way to get a lander into lunar orbit that could take astronauts to the surface and bring them back. That's where the Human Landing System program came in. The idea sounded simple enough. Get astronauts from that high lunar orbit down to the surface, keep them alive there for 7 to 30 days, and get them back up to the orbiting capsule. But as straightforward as that might sound, this part of the plan has turned out to be one of the hardest to pull off. SpaceX won NASA's Human Landing System competition and was awarded the Artemis III mission, along with three follow-on missions. Later, Blue Origin secured the Sustaining Lunar Development contract, which includes the Artemis V and VI missions. SpaceX's solution, the Starship Lunar Lander, requires orbital refueling in low Earth orbit, around 16 Starship tanker launches for a single mission. This level of in-space refueling has never been attempted before and is currently one of NASA's biggest concerns with the approach. However, this challenge isn't unique to SpaceX. Blue Origin's concept also relies on complex in-space logistics. It requires launching a refueling depot, followed by multiple tanker flights, and a final refueling in lunar orbit. The exact number of missions hasn't been specified, but the underlying problem is the same. 
The truth is, the complexity of what NASA is trying to do makes in-space refueling almost unavoidable. Getting a lander from Earth to the lunar surface and back to near-rectilinear halo orbit is a much harder problem than just sending a capsule to lunar orbit and back home. There are a lot of moving parts that all have to work together for on-orbit refueling to succeed. And if any one of them fails, it can create a domino effect that leads to delays or even full mission failure. But there's at least one part SpaceX isn't too worried about. Docking. SpaceX is confident that docking two of their own starships shouldn't be any harder than docking Crew Dragon with the ISS. And Dragon does that all the time. On September 6th, during the World Space Business Week conference, SpaceX President Gwyn Shotwell addressed this directly. Can we transport propellant? Is that propellant cold enough? That is really the experiment. That is what you'll see from us trying next year, she said. She added, Hopefully it's not as hard as some of my engineers think it could be. Storing cryogens in space is difficult because of their extremely low boiling points. They tend to boil off over time if the temperature can't be tightly controlled. On Earth, cryogen storage tanks use passive cooling and intentionally vent their contents to the atmosphere to relieve pressure during warm-up. But in space, that kind of venting isn't an option, and it significantly shortens the usable life of the fuel. While orbital refueling is hard, especially at SpaceX's scale, it's not impossible. In fact, NASA has already been working on this to a degree aboard the ISS. It's called the Robotic Refueling Mission Phase 3. The primary objectives are to demonstrate techniques necessary to perform cryogenic liquid methane transfer in microgravity and to maintain cryogenic fluid mass long-term, up to three months, via zero boil-off. The previous phase of the robotic refueling mission, RRM-2, demonstrated many of the preparation tasks leading up to cryogen replenishment, such as removing caps and valves and installing coolant line adapters. RRM-3 focuses on the final step, connecting, sealing, and managing the hoses needed to enable cryogenic fuel transfer on orbit. Since its launch in December 2018, RRM-3 has demonstrated the first-ever long-term storage of cryogenic fluid with zero boil-off, successfully storing cryogenic liquid for four months on station prior to the scheduled venting operation in April. A critical part of RRM-3 is the demonstration of zero boil-off storage of its 42-liter liquid methane supply using active cooling. By using cryocoolers and advanced multi-layer insulation to balance temperatures, RRM-3 successfully stored liquid methane for four months with zero boil-off, demonstrating a system that dramatically reduces fluid loss and eliminates the need for oversized tanks and extra propellant. Honestly, I believe SpaceX will eventually figure out all the issues and overcome them. The real question is whether they can do it fast enough. Elon Musk had previously predicted, and NASA had announced, that SpaceX would attempt its first ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfer test early this year. That has now been delayed until at least 2026. Still, Musk has recently expressed confidence in Starship's progress. In remarks made earlier this month during a podcast, he said, Unless we have some very major setbacks, SpaceX will demonstrate full reusability next year, catching both the booster and the ship and being able to deliver over 100 tons to a useful orbit. After that milestone, Starship will need to successfully demonstrate at least one uncrewed landing on the moon, followed by a successful ascent back to orbit, before NASA considers it reliable enough for crewed lunar landings. To be fair, SpaceX is already pouring virtually unlimited funding and resources into getting Starship operational, and the pace of development is astonishing. What's truly impressive is how little each anomaly or failure has actually slowed the program down. If NASA were running a similar program, even a single failure like SN7, SN8, or SN9 might have delayed the timeline by a year each. The Ship 36 explosion alone could have set things back by another 6 to 12 months. But for SpaceX, those cumulative failures have caused about 7 to 8 months of delays, and even then, the program is already back on track. The system is being built to launch at an insanely high rate, especially for a vehicle of this size. They're now very close to completing a full orbital flight and catching both stages. Once that happens, launches will begin ramping up quickly. 
With both Pad B and Launch Complex 39A expected to be fully operational by June next year, they'll be ready to demonstrate on-orbit refueling soon after. Once that demonstration is complete, more resources can be dedicated to the HLS lander development. By 2027, Starship could be flying on a bi-weekly schedule, with a test fuel depot likely going up to refine the refueling process. Given this trajectory, a 2028 target doesn't seem out of reach. If the US truly views landing on the moon before China as a race, where the only goal is simply to get there first, it might make more sense to pursue a less complex approach, something more akin to the Apollo program. However, it's not entirely clear that this is a race in the traditional sense. China's lunar program is methodical, well-planned, and effectively executed. They've been working steadily for over 20 years, sticking to a clear timetable. Their efforts are driven by long-term goals and national pride, which ensures consistent funding and political support. That said, their program tends to be more conservative and less focused on innovation. On the other hand, while Starship might appear overly ambitious, or even unnecessarily complex, for a single moon landing, it makes far more sense when seen in the broader context. Starship is not being built just for a lunar mission. If successful, it will be capable of launching thousands of tons to low Earth orbit annually, delivering the largest payloads in history to destinations across the solar system enabling regular lunar landings, Mars missions, and much more. In that light, developing a bespoke system solely for a one-off moon landing is actually the more limited and potentially more wasteful approach. You may be skeptical about whether SpaceX will achieve everything it's aiming for, but that's beside the point. These are their goals, and they are actively building toward them. The true race isn't about who touches the moon first, it's about who stays who builds lasting infrastructure, bases, and industry on the moon and beyond. For that vision, we will need Starship.